I've been ordering DIY PCBs as a hobbyist now for about a year. And oddly, they've mostly worked first try. Until now. On my most complicated, most expensive project yet, I basically ordered a brick and it was all my fault. JLC PCB didn't mess up, I did. So in this video, I'm going to show you how it happened, what I did to fix it, and talk about the steps you can take to avoid expensive mistakes like mine. I'm Josh, and this is Signal Drift. This is a custom RGB LED driver board. Unlike anything you can find in the market, it can drive 32 independent strings, tens of thousands of LEDs. It's got Cat5 connectors so I can daisy chain boards for very large installations, IR input, audio input for sound-based shows, and an SD card slot to load even more complex displays. But it's a brick it doesn't work. I've been lucky so far. I've done very simple designs. I've picked over them obsessively. I've got help from online forums and it's been like magic. You design something in your head, put that down on paper or in pixels, uh, push order, and you've got a working board in under a week. It's amazing. It's magical. I can't tell you how cool it is to see an idea that you have in your head actually come forth in working hardware. It's very cool. Now, I'm not an expert. I come from software and I took very basic electronics in college. I am constantly learning and I have a lot more to learn on my journey. So did I screw up some sort of complicated signal integrity rule? Did I miss decoupling capacitors? Did I violate one of those 10 worst things you can do in a PCB design rules? No, I, I've watched all those videos. Nope, I simply miswired a critical component. So here, maybe you can help me debug it and let's see if you can figure it out before I do. There's a bug. At first, I plugged the board in and the lights lit up. It works, right? Well, no. <laughs> I tested the power rails and that's all good. And that's, that's what those LEDs were indicating. The three volt rail, the five volt rail, and the 12 volt rail were all good. Then I needed to see if I could flash the firmware. I plugged it in, the flash tool recognized it. The Raspberry Pi Pico presents a USB drive where you can drag over your flash firmware. And that worked too. So it looked like USB was working. It looked like the board was communicating. Everything looked good. And then I flashed code to the board. After I did that, I couldn't see the USB serial connection and the board didn't appear to be running the code that I'd given it to execute. Testing on a known good board proved the simple test program was valid and that the simple testing results were echoing back on the USB serial, but back to the new board and nothing. This was really frustrating. Usually if a board connects via USB and allows you to flash the firmware, everything's working. The CPU is executing instructions. Everything is golden. So I chatted with Codex and Claude a bit about the problem. Imagine an AI Greek chorus, sometimes helpful, sometimes not mostly annoying. At first, they thought the crystal oscillator might be bad or miswired. I scrutinized the schematic in the PCB layout and could find nothing wrong. I scoped X in and I found a 12 megahertz sine wave, so that wasn't it. But I mean, I guess a good guess. We also checked the 3v3 rail and the 1v1 rail for stability and ran it off a bench power supply to verify that the power draw was reasonable, that there's no brownouts on startup. So the board is checking out so far. Then the AI consensus seemed to be something to do with the storage. It was really weird that the boot select mode was working. In other words, Raspberry Pi Picos have this mode where when you plug them in, they present as a USB storage device that you can drag firmware over onto, and that was working. That meant USB was working, and that the firmware load process also at least appeared to work. So I tried a lot of different settings. Each time the program appeared to flash, but then the device would just reboot. Then Claude suggested a really cool idea. Yeah. Now that you've come to your senses. I could load the firmware to memory instead of flash to see if the flash was the problem. I didn't even know this was a thing, but of course there are microcontrollers that run without flash. They either get programmed externally or maybe have a custom bootloader that runs from ROM. I mean, just look at me getting all bougie with my modern microcontroller with a nice big 16 megabyte flash drive. So I tried it. A change in the make file tells the boot process to boot from RAM, and a simple change in the command that loads the program tells it to load into RAM instead of flash. And 
boom, it worked. Okay, so the flash is definitely suspect. Inspecting the flash tip, it looked to be soldered properly, it wasn't rotated, and it was aligned. Maybe the chip was bad, but I'd already tried all the other boards too. One chip could be bad, not five. I've used this exact same combination of flash chips and microcontroller before. In fact, I copied the design from an open source design, and for Pixelblit, I copied that copy. This is one of the best ways you can avoid issues like this. Copy stuff that you know works. But I did. Didn't I? Well, kinda. Let's see if you can see the issue. Here are the schematics showing the flash chip in the middle connected to the microcontroller. Can you tell which one is the newer board? This one. And I got fancy. I learned that you could reorder the pins in the schematic to make things line up nicely. Doesn't that look pretty? But when you do this, it breaks all the existing connections in the schematic, so you have to rewire the schematic. And on the flash chip, I saw DI and DO, and naturally thought that they mapped to QSPI D1 and QSPI D0. But those are D1 and D0, not DI and DO. Because this chip supports both SPI and QSPI, in SPI there's just two data lines, data in, aka MOSI, and data out, aka MISO. I mapped in and out to one and zero because of how similar their first letters are. Mea culpa, that was exactly backwards, and you can see that if you trace the older schematic, which was verified to work. This board was doomed to fail because of a simple miswiring. So what to do? I could just limp along using RAM only, but if the boards lose power, they need to be reprogrammed. And it also limits the amount of RAM that I have for data because the program takes up some of the RAM. Ideally, I'd like to fix this problem. We've seen all those videos where somebody expertly fixes a PCB under a microscope, right? Well, this will not be that, but let's give it a shot. First, let's take a look at the PCB. Which pins are swapped? It looks like pins two and five, so in theory, I can lift those pins and solder bodge wires to the correct pads. It should work, right? How hard can it be? How hard can oh it be? So first, I touch up the pads with some low melt solder to make it easier to remove this chip with a hot air gun. So far, just like in all the videos, but I've got a little cleanup. There we go. Now I bend up pins two and five. Those pins are fragile, so I do it carefully. There we go. Now I made some bodge wires from 30 AWG enameled wire. I solder those onto the two pads and then solder the chip back down. It's a bit crooked, but I make it work. I really don't want to remove the chip again. It's a lot of heat and stress on the chip and the board. I do some continuity testing to make sure there are no shorts, then wire up the bodge from pin two to pin five, and then vice versa. A little more continuity testing. I clean it up. Just like all those repair videos, right? Nailed it. I clean up the wires a bit and then test and... Yes, it works. It works. Yes. <laughs> Here's the board running a test harness. Now I only have to do this three more times. How hard could it be? So what's the moral of the story? Stick to known good designs by copying what works, which is what I thought I was doing. But I made a change so it wasn't an exact copy anymore. I should have been much, much more careful when I did that and double and triple check the before and after. When you get a board back that doesn't work and you are a relative beginner like me, you are stuck chatting with the idiot AI course to try and figure things out. You may get there eventually, but it's painful. I've learned my lesson. On to finding the next hardware bug in this design, and I'm sure there are a few. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Josh, and this is Signal Drift.